did. We thought that it would make um, a nice change of pace for his videos, but also um, just for talks and be more fun at the end of the semester to do an interview format. So um, that's what we're doing today. Um, yeah, my hair is down here. I'll like lose no my hat. tie for this real casual. No hat. <laughs> should, I, should, I should I turn the hit, should I turn the chair backwards just for that extra like? <laughs> We're kind of wrapping it forward like, here, you know? Yeah, I have, yeah, we can, can we, oh, like, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think I can physically sit there. You can't, okay, <laughs> that's, that's fine. The there we go, <laughs> between two ferns, there we go, yes. Oh, we're not, I, I, I'm not that funny. Um, remember, so, I am printed on my 75-year-old grandfather. I have two acceptable ways I can sit. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going to cycle between those two. Okay. Okay. Well, you are only from the top up here on your video, That's so good. we're all good. That's good. Okay. They don't know I'm not wearing shoes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so, and if you don't know me, and again, I think everybody in this room knows me, um, but for the YouTubers, uh, I am Dr. Brenna Bird. I am a, a professor here at the University of Kentucky, and um, I teach sometimes Old Norse. Um, and I teach Germanic mythology, which this is a rare treat for us because usually I have Jackson zoom into, sorry, Dr. Crawford, zoom into my class. Um, uh, and this is our first time actually getting you here in person, which is um, quite nice. So this is a culmination of a very long semester of hard work. Um, I use two of Dr. Crawford's uh, books in my class. Um, the translation of the Saga of the Volsungs and the, um, the uh, two heroic champions is that the name? Two sagas of two heroes. sagas of mythic heroes. There we go. Um, I, and those are the ones that we read for um, the semester. And so it's really nice to have you here in person. So thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. First time in Lexington. First. So what is your impression as a Colorado Wean, Coloradian? <laughs> <laughs> well, the grass is not blue as advertised, but it's. <laughs> But it's been a special pleasure for me to meet you and Andrew in person. That's, yeah, After we've so many years of being in touch just electronically. Right. And that's been a big deal. Yeah, so that's kind of like I, I had to think for a minute, like actually we haven't met in person until now. So this is quite, yeah. you know, it's my online friend. And no longer, I, I get to say he's my real friend now. Not, not just online. <laughs> So, um, we're just old enough that that matters. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I have a lot of questions. Um, like I said, we wanted to do this internet format. Um, I have some questions that I think have come up throughout the semester. Some questions that, um, I have in my head that I just come up and I think, oh, I should ask Jackson about this. Um, I wanted to talk to you first though, about something that, um, I think connects both of us is that both of us are really passionate about educating the public, about making things accessible, and about um, getting rid of the gatekeeping of things like Norse mythology and Old Norse and studies of the past, medieval studies and things like that. And so I wanted to ask you about your feelings toward outreach and um, whether you feel like this type of outreach, like YouTube, uh, YouTube channels, working on video games, which is something both of us have done, you know, how do you feel that that is valued as scholarly outreach and um, does that matter? So how is it valued by other scholars in the academic community in the field? I mean, I think that yeah. it varies a lot. Uh, when I started the YouTube channel and late 2016 i was at the university of california berkeley teaching there and uh you know it's definitely an institution that thinks a lot of itself uh, <laughs> a lot of people who teach there think a lot of themselves <laughs> uh, we we can both name names yes <laughs> yes um, we can <laughs> and there was a lot of skepticism toward the project there mm, okay um, which project meaning the youtube, the YouTube thing, channel really, okay. yeah um, I think that there's this notion that pervades academia or some corners of academia that reaching out to the public is something people do when they don't know their subject very well, mm. right? It's like you can't cut it with real publications. That's mm -hmm. why you're talking to the unwashed masses, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, not to, uh, 
I'm not reaching for a comparison for myself, but only for someone who tried to do something somewhat similar and did it on a much grander scale. And better, Carl Sagan um, yes. was not always particularly well regarded within the community that. of astronomers. Huh. Right? People tend to look down at the cosmos thing. You know, he did real work. Yeah. He understood his subject well. I think to explain a subject well, you have to know it pretty well. But yeah, so there, there was some some reluctance about that. My my response to that has always been, if we don't do it, someone else does. It will be someone who doesn't know it as well and who may have an ideological agenda. Mm -hmm. That ideological agenda may be harmless, and it might not be. Especially in this field. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, no. um, but that hasn't always been true. You know, as I have done this for longer, mm -hmm. and as I have uh, managed to bring more scholars onto my channel, this is one thing that I've been trying to do is provide a platform mm -hmm. for people in my field and related fields to come on and talk to the public about their areas of expertise. I think people have realized that, you know, while I am not, I mean, there's no peer review process for YouTube, um, that I'm not just it's, it's not just a self-glorification project. In fact, I want to share the platform. I want people who know a lot to come and talk directly to the public because people don't know where to look for mm -hmm. information. You know, you can Google, is this language mutual intelligible with this language? And you might find something on, uh, what's that site, Quora? Yes. Or yeah, something, Quora. right? Mm -hmm. But you don't know, you don't know who's answering that. Mm -hmm. You know, or I can actually find somebody who knows and bring them on and have them answer these questions. So I like to connect people with the experts who have the answers they want. Nice. Sometimes it's me. Hmm. Most of the time it really isn't, but I know who it is. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so related to that, I want to talk to you about your translations because um, one of the reasons that I use your translations is because of how accessible they are. And I find that it's, it's really hard to find translations of important works um, it, culturally important works in a language that we can understand. I feel like sometimes the more important the work, the bigger the words and the harder the prose. And um, I really like, for me, your your translations feel like the original Old Norse. They're, they're um, yeah, <laughs> well, no, I, I love them. I love them. And, and I that's one of the reasons I choose them for class. And so I wanted to ask you about your feelings about this balancing act of staying, staying true to the original, and choosing language and um, choosing language that resonates with the audience and is accessible to the audience, but also um, holds up to the audience's expectations. Yeah, and another actual thing you have to balance there is you talk about uh, accessible English. Mm -hmm. And if you talk about that too much where people see it, they start thinking, oh, you're insulting me. <laughs> it's like, you know, it, our, it, you, you don't want people to think they're going to pick up your book and it's going to be see Thor run, 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 <laughs> Thor can't run. <laughs> like, that's, like when we say accessible, we don't mean right. kindergarten level. Right? Right. Like that's, that's not what it's about. It's about, you know, there's not a million footnotes and in notes. There's not, you know, archaic vocabulary. There's not thou art, mm -hmm. right? I'm not assuming that we all know the difference between various kinds of pole arms, right? You know, um, some people do, that's fine, but I don't assume it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like to say that the target for my translations, and this is also something people can hear as an insult, so hear me out, it's not, is my grandma. That is not me saying my grandma is dumb. It is saying my grandma is not obsessed with the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. right? She's an intelligent reader, very educated woman, reads about all kinds of things. She really doesn't know much about the Middle Ages, so I don't assume that she knows what a Bernie is or that she enjoys reading Thou Art from someone born in 1985, right? <laughs> I think that there's this attitude that if something is old, it needs to sound old in English. Mm -hmm. I've never really agreed with that. Um, we actually talked about some other reasons that people might want that earlier, but that's that's a whole other subject that maybe we'll get into. Um, spin-off YouTube. Spin-off subject, yeah. <laughs> um, I, and I wanna, so this accessibility and, and things that your grandmother could read. Um, that does sound bad when I read. No, no, I say this all the time. When I say, you know, if you're, if this is what, I mean, I, 
it's the exact same. I don't know if it's a Texan thing, but like, um, I I always say, you know, write your your presentations for the public, write your uh, presentations for class as if you know, your grandmother were reading it yeah. or your friend who's never taken this class before, because that is how you can demonstrate you actually know something is if you can put it in simpler terms and explain all of the context. So I, I would I say the same thing, but I want to make that going uh, into that a little bit because I feel I want to to talk about the cowboy Habemol and the cowboy aesthetic and what you think the tie is between this Western aesthetic. Um, James, would you mind closing the doors? Actually, yeah, I'm la, la, la. Thank you. Cash, could you close the other door for us? Thank you. Yes, I can make it. It's about to get real. Yes. <laughs> Lock the doors. Um, <laughs> so um, no, I. I wait, yeah. <laughs> we, we are talking it's Western. It's time for a here. reading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I do want to, I do want to look into that a little bit. And what, what overlaps do you see between, say, a Western type of cowboy mythology and? Um, the sagas and you know, okay, and your persona. As I'm, gonna, I'm gonna run with doctor. this. Sure, well, you're not there anymore, but you with the, the hat. And <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna run with this in a maybe a couple different side. I'm gonna zigzag with this a little bit. Okay, you go for it. I think people get really, really concerned with authenticity in mm -hmm. presentations, and uh, I know that I am not what you would design in a lab or you know, plug into an AI to be the guy teaching you about Norse mythology, right? I neither have the tweed jacket with the patches, mm -hmm. nor do I have the two foot long beard and the ISC armor tattoo, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not by like identity, either a typical professor or a Viking guy. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that you typically expect to be talking to about this. But I think this project would not have lasted as long if I was trying to put on either of those personalities. Mm -hmm. I have to kind of be myself because when I'm exhausted, which is most of the time at this age, um, <laughs> the only person I can be is myself, mm -hmm. right? I don't want that extra layer of like projecting something else. Mm -hmm. And so I just dress as myself, I just talk as myself, I just do things as myself. That ties into the culture that I grew up in, which uh, you might say is kind of maybe not cowboy culture, but cowboy idolization culture, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it's not like that many people I know are working cowboys. I do know some working cowboys, but that's mm -hmm. not most of who I know. You know, my grandfather was uh, one of these mid 20th century guys who grew up watching all those Westerns and certainly grew up in a lot of the places they were made. and dressed in boots and a hat all his life, and he was my hero, so I just kind of picked up his style, and it's not as weird where I come from, <laughs> okay? Like, I feel weird going through the O'Hare airport sometimes, yeah. you know, you get some weird comments, Yeah. but yeah, where I come from, it's not so weird. Um, it's not necessarily that I think that there's some particularly special connection between, you know, Western Americana and Norse stuff, although asterisk. Mm -hmm there's some connection, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that the sagas are in a sense, Iceland's Westerns. They fulfill a very similar cultural role. They are nostalgic literature about a time and then you were men, right? So the frontier was not quite settled and you settled things by fighting mm -hmm. and not just by talking to each other. I think that's a similarity. Um, but for me, the cowboy Haldemal, and what that is for anyone who doesn't know is Haldemal is Norse book of Proverbs, words of wisdom from the god Odin. It always reminded me of the advice that my grandfather gave me, and so the cowboy Havamal is Havamal translated into how he would say it, right? So it's not my typical, more textbook academic English that I'm going to write. It's, you know, earthier, right? More, more regional. But I think you could just as well make a cowboy Ecclesiastes. You could make a cowboy book of Proverbs. Yeah. Probably somebody has done that. That sounds like that sounds like something in a souvenir shop in just the right town. Oh, definitely. You know what I mean? Like, 
Wimberley. Wimberley, oh yes, Wimberley. <laughs> it's on the shelf somewhere. Yes, <laughs> so we're in Wimberley. Sorry, Wimberley. Um, or Sheridan, Wyoming. Sheridan, Wyoming. Yeah. So I, why do you think, why do you think the, um, what first appealed to you? How about that? What first appealed to you about, um, I, maybe like a little backstory into how did you get started in Old Norse and then why did you stick with that what appeals to you about the sagas what appeals to you about the pro the poetic edda like what appeals to you about these things all right there's a version of the answer to this question that i'd probably get hanged for doing again because so many people have heard it but um they very, have not heard it maybe they have <laughs> that's true i don't know what videos you've made them watch <laughs> <laughs> i don't hey um, voluntarily these are poor suffering individuals <laughs> um I was a big dinosaur kid, still big into dinosaurs. Come to come to Stegosaurus Day, Saturday, Morrison Natural History Museum, Morrison, Colorado, Western Denver. Um, that's far away from y'all. Um, <laughs> Road trip. Yeah, I, I really love, love dinosaurs, so I went to a middle school that actually offered Latin. Mm -hmm. This dates me. Um, I don't know if many middle schools do that anymore. I took Latin because the dinosaur names were in Latin, and from studying Latin, I realized language evolves. I was really interested in, you know, when I was a kid, when we were kids, it was kind of news mm -hmm. that birds were dinosaurs. Yes. I was real fascinated by this, and also evolution was kind of a forbidden subject because my mom's side of the family was creationist. Interesting. So it fascinated me, and uh, learning that language evolved, got real into that. And my grandma took me to this used bookstore that used to be in Denver called Tattered Cupboard. It's still there, but it's not the same. But they used to have just piles of books. Uh -huh. And one day I'm looking through the piles and I find Sweet's Anglo-Saxon Primer. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm like, oh, this is like, this is the dinosaur to English as bird. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So it really fascinated me. And then in college, I wrote all these fan letters to historical linguists um, and Brent Vine, at UCLA wrote me back oh, and he said, hey, you know, you, uh, you just taught yourself old English, you teach yourself old Norse, it's kind of similar. That's what I did. And I got real into old Norse in particular, even while studying a lot of other historical and European languages. At what age? 17, 18. Um, because there's more interesting stuff to read. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also kind of liked that it was like an exotic cousin to English. Right. It's like it's recognizably similar, but it's also just gone on its own weird path. Mm -hmm. Right. I liked that. Well, a lot just appealed to me. No family connection. Everybody always expects that, especially when you go to grad school in Wisconsin. Everyone's, you know, everyone's named Torgerson. <laughs> you know, it goes back on Thanksgiving to the UP or whatever. And it's like, no, I have no family connection to it. Well, yeah, maybe Scottish, by way of Scottish Vikings. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, maybe. Maybe. You know, you know. So I'm gonna ask a question that I know some people would like to, to talk about. How did you land the gig working for Assassin's Creed Valhalla? Yeah, so, I mean, it goes back to my first media gig. Um, when I was teaching at UCLA, I was just the closest person to Burbank who taught Old Norse. Um, nice. So Disney reached out, and actually originally, I was connected to a movie Disney was making that never got made. Um, so, well, so Disney, I didn't say that. I said Assassin's Creed. I know, but it leads to, okay. Okay. It's, it's how I got into Sorry. media stuff. Making sure. Yeah. Yeah. So then I, uh -huh. I got attached to Disney's Frozen and then having been attached to Frozen, it was a high profile enough thing that I guess word just leaked through the industry that I would talk to media companies. So let's talk about Frozen because I don't think everybody here knows that you worked on Frozen. So let's talk about what was, what did you do yeah, for this Frozen? Is, this is my, so I have different levels of party trick depending on the age of my audience. <laughs> <laughs> so the party trick that either I pull or that a friend pulls if there's anyone under 10 is, oh, you worked on Frozen. And so I'll tell you how kids react to this. Oh, no. it's, not, it's not what you want. Oh, God. So like, you know, so the parent says, oh, he worked on Frozen and at first, Really? You know, and then, but of course, the inevitable question is, are you Olaf or, or Kristoff? <laughs> it's like, well, I'm not, you know, I actually work behind the scenes. I had a friend's uh, kid in Wyoming tell me, after I said, oh, I, I wasn't Olaf or Kristoff, he says, so you're nobody. 
that, that hit me hard, and it stuck with me ever since. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, so if you've ever seen, has anybody seen Frozen? I don't know. I don't know how many of you have kids. Um, Some of them were kids when it came out. God, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I have one foot in the grave. Um, <laughs> You're okay. It was 10 years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. It was a while ago. I still remember going. <laughs> I still remember picking my grandma up and t figuring out the theater was close and taking her to it. And the whole time, she's starting to be just like, Is that you? Is that you? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I wrote The Runes. And like there's the book in the beginning, and there's the gravestones. And there's a little bit of spoken old Norse in the coronation scene where the bishop puts the head on who's the queen. Is that Elsa or Anna? I can't even remember. But he puts the, the <laughs> crown on her head and he says, Ecte from der Ither Elsu Thron Arendals. And you can tell the voice actor is kind of trying to imitate me more there. His voice changes a little bit. Yeah, it sounds more like a hick. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then there's the, uh, the scene where the trolls try to marry. Christoph to Anna, mm -hmm. and they dig a pit and build an arch over it. Mm -hmm. So they had asked me, what's an Old Norse wedding like? And I said, well, in the sagas, they just say somebody got married. They talk about the partying afterwards, but they don't really describe the ceremony. But I said, there's this blood brother ceremony east of the saga where they dig a pit and make an arch over it. So that's what that's about. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. If you watch Frozen all the way through, all the way to special thanks, mm -hmm. first name, that last section. Special thanks. One That's day, awesome. one day, perhaps not too far away, I'll be this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be this near corpse, perhaps with this expression on my face, <laughs> in some alley in Colorado Springs, and I'll be screaming at people. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. I worked Thank you, Angie. <laughs> I worked on Frozen. No, it's good. Thank you, Angie. It's, Thank it's you. actually fine if it gets yeah. <laughs> Something about my own face creeps me out. <laughs> so, um, and so from Frozen, from your work on Frozen, then you got into some other media gigs through just yeah, people new. Right, a couple of History Channel things. Mm -hmm. um, American Gods, the TV show. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, that was actually a lot of fun. Ian McShane, because I'm a huge Deadwood fan. Okay. So I got to actually coach Ian McShane on his old Norse lines. That was sweet. Nice. Really nice guy. Nice. Um, yeah, and then Assassin's Creed Valhalla in 2018, 19, they reached out. Yeah. That's fun. What, um, what's your favorite project? Was it American Gods media project? Well, favorite person I got to meet is Ian McShane, yeah. Because okay. I mean, I got to meet Al Swearingen, right? Maybe that TV reference is too old for <laughs> um, But uh, absolutely the best company that I worked with uh -huh. was Ubisoft. Yeah. I mean, I think you and Andrew would agree. They're good people to work with. They are really nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, they care about stuff more than any of these other companies, right? I mean, they really, really care. Yeah. Um, I felt like something more than just what I call the actually insurance mm -hmm. with them. You know? Why don't you explain, because we were talking about this earlier, why don't you explain to that, because this is something that I've we've talked about in class actually, is this idea of you know, authenticity and why do people care about authenticity in fictional works? And, <laughs> yeah. and so explain what you mean by the actually insurance. Most, this, this will shock y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry to drop this truth bomb, but most media production companies do not give a tarnation about, uh, you know, Old Norse or whatever, right? They really don't care. And the idea of spending $2 to get it right is horrendous, <laughs> right? Like, I'm gonna cut this out of the video, but I'll tell it to people. <laughs> That's like the good thing about conlang, because there's no Google Translate right. for conlang. That's true. So. <laughs> you gotta um, get into the conlang business. But they do want, they do hate uh -huh. the actually the grades on the internet. They don't want to be, because they know they'll kind of become notorious of something that people really notice is wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think often they hire people in positions like mine to be their actually insurance, right? They brag against the actually brigade, right? They brag, oh yeah, you know, we hired so-and-so, you know, we gave them a sandwich. 
um, <laughs> to do the actual link for you. Yes. And we didn't really listen to them, but <laughs> it's like about the credits. Um, obviously, again, some companies were better than others, right? Mm -hmm. Ubisoft is actually very good about this stuff. Yeah. By contrast, um, so one of my best friends actually lived the dream and is a paleontologist now. Yeah, he has his own museum. Come visit us. Morrison Natural History Museum, Mr. Timber Holler. No. But it's sponsored by Morrison. Yes. <laughs> no, they're in the front. But um, we were approached by one of these companies once about having our own TV show. And it almost happened. We filmed a pilot. The idea was we were going to go around the world and we were going to go to places where, you know, there were fossils that had been known since antiquity. We were going to talk about, well, he was going to talk about the fossils and I was going to talk about maybe the mythical beasts that were based on these fossils. Cool. And the thing that sank the show was that they insisted that we had to mold Walter and Scully. <laughs> But for those who've never this seen X-Files, yeah. Reference. One of us had, they, they insisted one of us had to pretend to believe in the monsters. <laughs> right? So like, or that dinosaurs had survived or something and just neither one of us could pull it off. <laughs> like, like I can't, so I can lie if I think it's funny. <laughs> but I could, because, you know. But I couldn't pull this off for episode after episode after episode. I'm like, gee whiz, I'm sorry that this dragon wasn't real, but that's what they wanted. And like, I just straight up couldn't deliver it. Speaking of people wanting authenticity, mm. like I knew that I couldn't deliver that for authentic things. Yes. Maybe if there'd been a million dollars in it. Right, I can lie, you can lie for humor and a million dollars. Um, that's about right, that's about my boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever gonna offer me a million dollars to lie. So. Never say never. Um, I guess I shouldn't. Okay, so I wanna, my next question um, is, and this is something that I think about a lot. We've had this discussion, I've talked to this to, to my students every year, because I've been teaching Germanic mythology now for about 12 years, and I'm always interested in who enrolls in the classes and why. And my big question every year is why Vikings? Why are Vikings so interesting? Why are people in my classes wanting to know about the Vikings? What is it that, why are they so popular? Where does that come from? What is your, what is your take on that? You could also ask them, <laughs> why do y'all come to these classes? Well, yeah, okay, um, but fair. But like, why, why do you to think ponder this for a moment and yes. see what y'all think of my thoughts about it, because I've wondered about it myself. Um, I come at this as someone who is interested in the Old Norse language, right? I don't come at it originally from a deep cultural identification with Vikings or something, yes. right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people do have that. And I've noticed, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, yeah. if you look at 20th century media, Vikings are not generally portrayed very positively, right? They're not usually us from the perspective of the filmmakers or whatever, right? They're kind of, you know, raiding mean guys who often barely speak any language, whatever language. Actually, the language they make them speak is often an interesting question. In the 21st century, this really rapidly changes, and you get all of this media that portrays Vikings really positively. How to Train a Dragon, the Vikings TV show, all the video games, God of War, and et cetera, et cetera. Vikings have gone from antagonist to protagonist. That's interesting. I don't exactly know what the chicken and what the egg is there, mm -hmm. but there's a cultural change and a media change probably mutually driving one another. Mm -hmm. I have this abiding theory that a big part of it is the Lord of the Rings movies about 20 years ago. Um, some of y'all were born yeah. subsequent to this, but um, if you cast your memories back, you know, fellow living fossils, <laughs> there was this, you know, they were pretty big movies, right? I mean, it was kind of sensational. You know, you sit down in the theater, it's great music, you know, it's this big sweeping epic thing. Mm -hmm. People really wanted to immerse themselves in that. And I think a lot of people left those theaters thinking, where can I get more of this? Mm -hmm. And one place they can get more of it is Norse stuff, which was a lot of the inspiration for Tolkien. Right. So I think that was a big place where it started to turn. I think there's smaller drivers of it too. Um, immersive fantasy has been a growing entertainment industry since at least like the 70s. Mm -hmm. And when I say immersive fantasy, this starts off with, you know, D&D, &D, which 
when I was a kid, this was considered immersive, right? You know, you tell your stories to your friends around the table with your hot pockets. You know, now <laughs> people plug themselves into their, you know, their 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 whole rigmaroles mm -hmm. with their, you know, their DVDs and their Netflix and whatever, and their Playstations and what, you know. <laughs> you fangled technology. All this, all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. It, like that's super immersive. Mm -hmm. But like right as Vikings are getting more popular, so is all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that this is now something people want to immerse themselves in and they want to identify with the Vikings. They're not identifying with, you know, the people fighting the Vikings or whatever, mm -hmm. which is what it used to be. I can't fully explain it, but those are just some thoughts about why this is getting so big. And I, if you go search on YouTube or search on Google or search on whatever for Vikings, runes, Norse mythology, Thor, most of the people you're going to see talking to you about it are going to look like what they think you expect them to look like, right? They're going to be big beards. I bet you there's an ice yammer, big beast or tattoo, that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. People identify with it super strongly. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm an odd man out and not looking like a Viking, right? I'm trying to project that stuff. Mm -hmm. So people want to be it. Not everybody who's into it, but a lot of people really want to be something that you look this now. Yeah. Um. I, I, that's interesting because again, like if you want to be it, there's also that thing about authenticity. Yeah. And so, um, which I lack, yeah. right? This is a, this is a, this is a, no, I mean like in a, from a certain perspective, from a certain audience, right. this is a complaint. Right. Right. This isn't your religion. Right. You didn't grow up in Scandinavia. This mm. isn't, this isn't yours. And I think a lot of people, you know, this is a, this is an age in which people often feel rootless, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, a lot of traditions are, are gone or radically changed, you know, people live in a very different world than their parents and grandparents did and are looking for something to grasp onto. And sometimes this, it looks like something to grasp onto. I don't fully understand that, but I think actually something I was mentioning earlier, maybe part of the reason I don't fully understand that or fully seek that grasping at roots is that I'm not as alienated from those roots. Mm -hmm. I live 28 minutes from Crawford Gulch you know, like I know my roots, um, and don't like have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. okay. But I think someone growing up, you know, maybe with a sense of alienation from their family or from the culture around them, you know, looking for something to identify with, I, I, I can get how that might happen. It seems cool, mm -hmm. right? If I can identify with anything, maybe I should identify with the most badass thing. Right. <laughs> so. so I want to and. Going further in that, then, with authenticity and storytelling, um, what do you think is the most important thing for authenticity when readapting these stories, whether it's translation or media stories? Like, what, for you, what counts as authentic? Yeah. The actually guys on the internet mostly care about physical culture. Mm -hmm. That breastplate was not used during that decade, mm -hmm. right? That kind of thing. Um, and that goes for Westerns too, you know. Actually, you know, cartridges had not uh, been invented at the time because the bad and the ugly is so, kind of thing. <laughs> um, but for me, I think, I don't notice that stuff as much, probably because I'm more of a language and culture guy than I am, mm -hmm. language and literature guy than I am a physical culture guy, not an archeologist. Um, I'm looking for more of the spirit of something. That sounds really amorphous, but it's one reason why, and I think this is actually a decent test of, of opinions on the actually stuff. I think one of the best Viking movies is The 13th Warrior, <laughs> which maybe none of you have seen. It's from before y'all were born. But there I, was I, this... I recommend it. They've seen, at least my students have seen one scene where he introduces himself as <laughs> Ibn Fahatlan, you know, and they're like, Ibn, right? So, so that's, they, know, they know that one at least. So there's a tragedy to this movie in a sense, because I mean, it's not objectively good. And I mean, you've got- Take it back. Uh, I love that movie. It's you've good. Got, it's, you've got Omar Sharif, right? Star of like Lawrence of Arabia and Dr. Zhivago, right? Two of the greatest mm -hmm. movies ever made. <laughs> He's just like, he looks so bored. <laughs> <laughs> I think he quit acting after this movie. Oh. Mm -hmm. But like, there is a core to it that gets the sense of humor right. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are kind of laconically laughing through the whole thing. You know, mm -hmm. I can't lift the sword, I'll grow strong. 
Right? I mean, like that is, it's, it's spiritually, if you will, it has a very Norse spirit. Hmm. Then you get something like 2022's The Northman, which I've gotten some flag for not liking, but this movie never laughs once. If you've ever seen this movie, I mean, 10 minutes in, they're burning a house full of children and it stays about that door, you know? Like, it's just, it's, it, it never winks at you. And it's like, hey, you know, we're at the movies, folks. You know, mm -hmm. like, pop that popcorn and have fun. Like, it's always just like, people are bad. <laughs> <laughs> Which, sure, the sagas are full of people who are bad, but there's some humor to it. Mm -hmm. There's some, you know, worldly wisdom to it. it. The narrator winks at you a time or two, you know? I just don't like to be, uh, lectured at or hit over the head mm -hmm. so even though it probably looks better in terms of like oh the ship looks like about like it should look the clothes look about like they should look mm -hmm. you know i don't like it as a viking movie or as a movie in general mm -hmm. interesting now then you talk about i mean actually assassin's creed hell is an interesting kind of case study here mm -hmm. because they really did work pretty hard on getting that physical culture stuff right but they also work pretty hard on the uh shall i say spiritual culture Mm -hmm. Right, I think they did incorporate a lot of vocabulary and, and humor and things like that mm -hmm. that, uh, that are pretty true to the source material. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good example of a balance. There's certainly exceptions. There's places where I'd say, oh, you know, like this design, like everybody always wants to pull out these, these designs like the Ice Yom and the Big Beaster and stuff, mm -hmm. which are a thousand years after the Viking Age. Like, I've always objected to that a little bit as an actually guy, but I don't care that much. You know, mm -hmm. that stuff is there on the edges. Yeah. Um, question also going back to, I realize we've been talking this whole time, the title of the talk is uh, Vikings and Valkyries, the years of beyond. I forget what we called yeah, it. Yeah, we did it. We did, we did the, we did the Vikings shop Vikings and run. Valkyries, video games of beyond. Man, so, that's, that's some Sean Penn level alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> so what about, what about, so let's talk about Valkyries and because we were talking about the image of the Valkyrie is like authentic um, versus spiritual. Oh yeah, that was one of the examples that we were talking about. Yeah. Where, um, okay, so there's there's sometimes a difference between real mm -hmm. and authentic, mm -hmm. right? So there's Valkyries is actually described in 800 year old vellum, right, in the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda. But then there's also in 2023 there's a kind of canon understanding of what a Valkyrie is, right? So you ask most people, and I think it's most people by now mm. in English-speaking world, what is a Valkyrie? They'll come up with an image that's kind of similar, right? It's a woman probably in armor. Maybe she flies on her own. Maybe she has a flying horse. Probably has a spear or sword or something. It's kind of a fierce look one way or another. That may not be very similar to what someone was imagining in the 1200s. may not be very similar to what someone was imagining in the 900s. But you have kind of a canon 2020s Valkyrie now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think part of what you're looking at now is that there, these stories, way more people know stories about Valkyries in the English-speaking world than ever did in the Old Norse-speaking world just by numbers, mm -hmm. right? These have become 21st century legends too. Yeah. I think that there's actually a sense in which you can be true to the 21st century mythos, right? Mm -hmm. Where was I going with this? <laughs> Something like Assassin's Creed Valhalla is very true mm -hmm. to a 21st century mythos. Yeah. Um, while also trying to honor that 12th century source mythos. Um, I'm sure I was driving at a point with this. I mean, it was the it was the difference between real and authentic, and like how yeah. does the the I mean, how does the symbol of the Valkyrie like? illustrate that point and I think you made the point I think I think that was a did I ever get yeah. the point? <laughs> yeah, yeah it was a little was big maybe I'll um, I was trying to I think it was good I think it was good uh, I want to make sure we have some time for questions does um so I will open up to questions around Izzy go um so going back to what you talked about in your translation and making them accessible and not overloading them with footnotes or endnotes how do you balance Also, having parts of the sagas that are so rooted in like very culturally specific things, and having and like 
where do you decide to take time to explain like, oh, this means this, or this has this particular significance here, which you might as like a modern day leader not immediately grasp from the text. Sure. I, I've evolved on this a little bit too. I don't do this exactly now as I did when my first book was published in 2015. But for example, with the Poetic Edda published in, uh, in 2015, I tried to get ahead of some of this a little bit by writing an introduction that I thought would encapsulate the cultural expectations that the original audience would have of the work that you're about to read. It's like, bear with me, I'm not gonna give you footnotes, but if you read the introduction, I think I can set you up with a lot of what you need to know going into this. I always have a glossary of names because I know there's a, we, the original audience expects everybody to remember not just lots of names, but the family trees that connect them. That's not something we're as used to, right? We're used to eight named characters in a movie. They all look really different and all their names start with a different letter, <laughs> right? They definitely don't care about that here. So I always have, you know, family trees and glossaries of names, things like that. Um, the most apparatus that I have is in my book, The Wanderers Hall of the Mall, which has Old Norse and English. And then it has notes at the end where I explain if something is not an exactly literal translation, I'll explain like what I did that's a little bit different. Or I'll say like, this seems very similar to an English idiom but it's not exactly that idiom in Old Norse. It's this other idiom that says something a little bit different, but you know, I felt like translating it this way to make it make sense when you read it. Here's, so there I really open up the hood more than I do in any other book. And then by the last book, which the, the Two Sagas book, I started putting in a couple places where I just thought, you know, the audience has more of a tolerance for Old Norse words than I originally realized. So occasionally just leaving an Old Norse word in and putting in just brackets and parentheses what it means. Right, to define it at first to help you see what that means. Because some there there are places like I, I don't really like being the translator who says, you know, I cannot express it in the English. <laughs> you know, you do not have the wealth of vocabulary. <laughs> but um, but there are some things that are such cultural institutions that they kind of make sense to just leave alone. Right? You know, Dranger, the Norse concept of you know the the, the reckless courageous man who has a sense of fair play. Like that's, it's such a wordy English translation if you translate it like that. I'd rather just translate the anger. Mm -hmm. Just leave it like that and explain what it means when it first comes up. Um, so I've evolved on that, um, but that's about where I'm at with it now and how I've done it in some books. Thank you. Okay, questions? Kaya, go ahead. Um, so I kind of have two, but I'll start with the easier one. Um, <laughs> you can start with the harder one and give me the easy one as a tr as a <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we can do that. So you were talking about the shift in um, how the reverse has happened from Vikings being the bad guy to Vikings now being looked at as the, the better version. And I immediately connected it with the political shift of wanting to rewrite the wrongs of like the white Christian religious trauma to wanting to rewrite the wrongs of, you know, pillaging and all that in Christianity, in these Viking areas, Scandinavian culture. And it made me think, how do you feel about that perspective as someone who's, you know, involved in a different angle than it being culturally tied for you? So you think part of what's going on, if I understand you, is people aren't identifying with the Christian victims of Viking raiding the same way, and they're starting to identify more with this, like, more hyper-masculine culture, something like that? No, they're viewing the Vikings as the victims now versus them being the bad guys. Vikings as victims. I, I think that does come up in some narratives that seem to be part of the Vikings TV show narrative yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, and that's something that's changed in our culture, too, in some ways, because it's hard to imagine in the 20th century there being that much appeal to a culture that's being put into a victim role. There's some ways in which lots of different subcultures try to grasp for that like victim crown or something now. And it's sometimes weird what it gets applied to. Yeah, that could be. Um, I don't know if I have a comment on it except to say that could be part of what's going on with people wanting to, to put that victim crown on Vikings, I don't know. Yeah, 
And so my other question was, when we actually all got kind of like entrenched with the Frozen film especially, they, in the first one, we talked about the song, and then the second one, they brought in an Icelandic singer to sing. Does she sing in Icelandic? Um, I mean, that's an Icelandic word. <laughs> Castle um, I think it, the artist is Aurora, is her name. Yes. Okay. And she went on and said that she did sing a whole song in Icelandic for it, but I don't know if it actually got put in the movie or not. I don't know either. But do you feel like you being the actually like, entrant, if they don't listen to you and they put your name on stuff, people then go, oh, well, he's not, he did something wrong. Oh, no, because no, well, like, yeah, occasionally, mm -hmm. but nobody really pays attention to this. Who reads the credits in a movie, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I know, <laughs> I know that I'm the first name in the last section of the credits on Frozen because I was looking for my name, Yeah. right? Like, who, nobody cares. I mean, it comes up in, like, one of those, did you know things on the internet, right? Did you know? that the runes in Frozen actually say stuff in Old Norse and Younger Futhark, and it was done by Jackson. Like, you can find that kind of thing occasionally. Mm -hmm. And yeah, occasionally, not very often, occasionally someone has said something to me like, well, you know, the Icelandic in that one song is really bad. Like, yeah, I didn't do it. <laughs> um, so, you know, don't know what to tell you. I agree, pal. <laughs> um, but that doesn't come up very much. People notice so little as a general thing, um, <laughs> you know, you didn't even notice the man in the gorilla suit who walked behind us. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen that, right? But it's, yeah. but but people are paying so much attention to all the visual cues that, like the language stuff, it's so few people who pay that much attention. Yeah. Plus, I mean, I didn't even know when I watched the movie. That, that song in Icelandic was even happening because it was just vague choral sounds. And it was like, oh, no, I can't, even if that's in English, I don't understand it. So. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yeah? Um, this isn't really a question for Dr. Robert, it's more of a comment. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for what you've shared with us. I guess just kind of um, building off of what's just been said and, and how you've responded to it. Um, yeah, not many people know this. Not many people are going to drill down to that level of detail. Nonetheless, someday, somebody is going to know this. Sure. And I assure you, Dr. Crawford, that people will study it. Um, at some point, the field, for example, of Disney studies. <laughs> That's true. I'm not joking. There no, is no, no. such a thing. It's right? true. That it's they true. will turn around and they'll look at and they will think critically about how the corporate structure of Disney, the copyright structure of, you know, what's going on, the sort of, what you say, sort of the economy of cultural of authenticity or, you know, the actually factor how they all played in together, and the name that they're probably going to settle on is yours. And they're going to think about, well, why did they bring on an Old Norse expert? And in what way did a kind of academic approach inform a public sort of popular cultural approach, but also the way in which these things are currently being um, reappropriated by culture? And I guess to turn that comment into a you know, some kind of question, how do you feel Thanks, about that? <laughs> if somebody who at some point, you know, somebody's going to critically take a look at this and think, well, why did they do it this way? Mm -hmm. um, whereas I don't know if the kinds of consultants have had that either sort of uh, philological input or historical input um, in earlier decades. And I don't mean like in the 2010s or the 2000s. I'm thinking like 1950. Yeah, right, right. Before I mean, How do you feel about that? Well, I think... Let me, let me think about this out loud for a moment. I mean, you, you see some older movies where thought is given to questions of language. I mean, The Searchers has, I th think, actual spoken Comanche, for example. It might be Navajo. I can't remember. But there's some attempt sometimes made to, to do language stuff, language extras in older movies. As far as anyone studying Disney and getting interested in, you know, why I would be involved and how and that sort of thing, I feel like the nature of things is that would be after I'm dead, right? 
you, you become of interest to people once you're gone. Um, but, uh, you know, if I'm still alive, I'll tell them some stories. I mean, frankly, I wonder why. Arendelle in Frozen is a fictional world. They never say it's Norway. No. Why did it have to be Old Norse? Why did it have to be Old Norse and the correct Viking Age, younger Futhark runes? I also wasn't the only person at UCLA they brought in. They brought in a grad student whose main qualification was he was from Denmark. And they had him watch scenes and say, when these two people who are strangers meet, are they standing the right distance from each other? Mm. Are they making the right kind of eye contact? They wanted them to act like Scandinavians. They were weirdly particular about some of this stuff. And I still look back on that. Why? You know, you could have kind of done anything and it would have been fine. It's a fictional world. Like just have them do whatever, make up whatever language, make up whatever alphabet. I think it's a, a curious thing. And I, I suspect some of it is just that, again, that like actual brigade stuff. They want to get ahead of those, those guys. But are they ever going to correct people on how far strangers sit from each other? You know, like it's just, it's so strange to me what they decide to, to correct or not correct. And then you get stuff like, probably there's no single project I've ever worked on and given input about language or runes where something about the language or runes is wrong in the final product. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, one of the thousands of people who saw this said, who cares, and changed something so that it it's not exactly right in the form. Um, language is never the highest priority with that stuff. Again, the best company about this is Ubisoft, but even Assassin's Creed, <laughs> weird. But even, <laughs> despite the curse of my, <laughs> but even Assassin's Creed Valhalla is about things I would quibble with as mm -hmm. far as language and root stuff go in the, the final product. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, that's not a satisfying answer. No, thank you, it's, it's interesting. But it's some thoughts. Yeah. yeah. All right, Kira, go ahead. I just have a question about like Norse storytelling and adaptations in the modern right. age. Yeah, um, in a lot of Norse stories, and I think uh, you mentioned this in your interview with the Ubisoft developers for Valhalla, um, that a lot of stories that they, they used for inspiration were very kind of um, uh, small and like independent stories that didn't have a lot of relation to each other, and that a lot of Norse stories in general have that same structure. Do you think it is important for adapting Norse legends to write them in a similar way to kind of keep the spirit of Norse storytelling? Or do you think that um, in order to maybe get people more interested in the subject that it follows a more modernized storytelling method such as connective tissue through each story that has a singular protagonist or is um, a, a through plot line such as like novellas and standards and such? I don't know if there's a clear-cut answer to this. I think that a talented writer could probably compromise pretty well on using a more authentically medieval storytelling style. There'd be compromises, but I think a talented, a really talented writer could do it. Um, I have to think about this a little bit, even with translation. Um, one thing that I've considered, you know, I've talked to my publisher Packet, great people, um, by the way. Um, talked to them about, you know, one day going back and translating a few more sagas, and one we've talked about is this the huge Yal saga. 800 named characters. And one of my ideas that I've had for a long time about if I approach that to translate it is move the, here's violating my own thing about footnotes, move <laughs> the genealogies to footnotes. Because a modern audience reads those lists of names. It's like, who do I pay attention to? <laughs> right? Monty Python has a sketch <laughs> long, long ago when there were only a few TV channels. There was a show called Monty Python. Anyway, <laughs> they have a sketch you can find online called The Joel Saga. And, mm -hmm. it's, and it starts off with this guy riding across this majestic Icelandic. Maybe it's actually Scottish landscape. That was in Japan. And um, the narrator says, you know, there was a man named such and such, son of such and such, son of such and such, son of such and such, cousin of such and such, who killed so and so, who wed so and so. And it's played up as this huge joke because it goes on for like two and a half minutes. <laughs> it's actually a chapter from Nelson. <laughs> right? 
It's not made up. And it's not from the beginning of the book. It's like chapter 114. I, so I've thought that is actually something that you might adapt. Um, you know, if I were to write a story, I, like, I, I, I don't know if I, I have it in me exactly, but if I were to write a, an original story set in this period, I don't think that I would try to imitate that style exactly because I feel like people just, it's so hard to get people to keep reading. Mm -hmm. You know, you want that first page to hook them. The first page is, there was a man named so-and-so, <laughs> son of so -and -so. It's tough, right? But I think you can move those pieces around mm -hmm. and keep people interested. I mean, we tell stories like that kind of, we just don't typically start with those lists. Unless you're the person writing checks in front of you at the line at the grocery store. <laughs> That lady will tell you stories that start that way. But most of us don't tell stories that start with, you know, sons, son of, son of, son of, it's kind of promote, son of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. um, I think we are, um, so we are at time. We're gonna move next door for refreshments. If you have your books with you, if you can't sell books, as they say, yay, yeah, there we go. You have your books. Um, I will uh, not refund you for them. Yeah. <laughs> We'll let him, of course, get like, uh, you know, have a little small, small break, but we'll get some refreshments next door. But before everybody stands up, let's give him a long round of applause. Thank you. And thank you all uh, for staying here on the last day of school to hang out with us and listen to him. So. Thank you so very much. All right.